Welcome to episode 7 of the Truth Quest podcast. Today we will tackle the global warming, global cooling, climate change issue. But before we do, I want to ask you to do me a favor and share the show with others. If the topics of the Constitution, minimum wage, the resurrection of Jesus, the NFL national anthem protest, or climate change come up, share the individual episode with your friend. Use these episodes to help you make more persuasive arguments. If you are so inclined, please consider supporting the show with a few dollars, all of which will be used to expand the show's reach. See the show notes page at truthquest.podbean.com for the link. That's podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N. Recently, there has been calls from the left for Facebook and other calls from the left for Facebook and other social media platforms to ban messages and videos from or about so-called climate change deniers. My first thought when I hear calls from either side of the political spectrum to ban the other side's speech is whoever is suggesting the ban has lost the argument. If their best play is to stop the other side from talking, they are done. It reminds me of a little kid while being scolded by his mother, closes his eyes and covers his ears in order to avoid the verbal onslaught. My second thought was, it's time to produce a podcast about this topic, climate change. So let's get started. The first thing I want to say off the bat is, I'm not here to prove or disprove global warming, global cooling, or climate change. That is the idea that man's activities are causing the Earth's atmosphere to change in a detrimental way. This is the so-called anthropogenic or man-made climate change argument. For the record... I concluded some time ago that the subject of man-made global warming, global cooling, climate change is a manufactured crisis. I would go as far as calling it a fraud or a scam. But that was after digesting a lot of evidence, much of which I will present in this episode. Hopefully after listening to this episode, you will understand how I arrived at that conclusion. Few topics exemplify the dirty half dozen better than this one. Remember, those are... Number one, malice or name calling. Number two, ignorance. Number three, emotional arguments and bias. Number four, the stiff arm. Number five, propaganda, lies, and deception. And number six, drawing arbitrary lines. We will cover each of these in the coming episode. For decades, we have been bombarded with apocalyptic warnings that the planet is heating up, humans are the primary cause, and of course, Dirty Half Dozen member number three. So the claim goes something like this. Carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere and creates a greenhouse effect over the Earth. Because of this greenhouse effect, the Earth will heat up. Because of the rising temperatures, all sorts of bad things will happen, like melting glaciers, large tracts of the Amazon rainforest will be wiped out, coastal flooding, killer superstorms, spreading tropical diseases, and starvation. Because man produces carbon dioxide, And because of these dire consequences, something must be done. That something is always a freedom and economy killing scheme of carbon taxes and limitations on the use of fossil fuels. Lifestyles must be changed. The cars we drive must be changed. The temperature we keep our homes must go up in the summer and down in the winter. Government must step in and stop this looming disaster. So let's start with some basic facts and consider some things we know for sure. We consider some things we know for sure. We know that the temperature increases have been nominal over the last 15 years. We know that there is no conclusive evidence that humans caused that rise, and we know that there are benefits to a warming planet. The Earth's temperature has always ebbed and flowed from cooling to warming. There are ice ages and warming periods. For the past 10,000 years, we have been going through a warming period. The warming of the Earth did not start with the Industrial Age in the 20th century. Mark Morano from Climate Depot had this to say, Internal global climate system variability accounts for at least 80% of the observed global climate variation over the past half century. It may even be more if the period of influence of major volcanoes can be more clearly identified and the corresponding data excluded from the analysis. So, just like in episode 2 and 3 regarding abortion in the Constitution, I armed you with when dealing with skeptics. What about the baby and where in the Constitution? When it comes to climate change, you must force advocates to answer the following questions. 
What about all the disinformation, lies, and data manipulation? This is the personification of Dirty Half Dozen member number five. Before we employ vast and oppressive regulations on energy usage, raise taxes, and drive up our utility bills, before we devastate and cripple the economy by sucking trillions of dollars out of it to combat this so-called pending disaster, shouldn't we be darn sure that the data we are basing our assumptions on is accurate and not agenda-driven? So what lies, disinformation, and data manipulation am I referring to? Let's start with one of the most famous pieces of global warming lies, the hockey stick chart. Invented by longtime global warming alarmist Professor Michael Mann, this, this graph claims to show that temperatures over the, over the last thousand years declined until the 20th century, when a sharp upturn occurred, thus the hockey stick. Until the chart's evidence was exposed as a fraud, it was excitedly adopted and cited by all the global warming alarmists, including the United Nations. The problem with the graph was one of omission, misuse of data, fundamental errors in the statistical methods used, and biased calibration procedures. See the work of Canadian statisticians Stephen uh, McIntyre and Ross McCurtick. And that will be in the show notes page as well. The graph did not properly account for the medieval warm period around 1000 AD, nor did it properly account for the Little Ice Age, which occurred around 1400 to 1800 AD. I encourage you to do some digging on that study on your own. Next, I want to discuss the claim that 97% of climate scientists agree that climate change is real. This is a great example of propaganda. How many times have you heard that claim? Former Secretary of State John Kerry carried this water in a speech in Indonesia in 2014 and he, where he said, 97% of climate scientists have confirmed that climate change is happening and that human activity is responsible. Scientists agree that the world as we know it will change and it will change dramatically for the worse. See what I mean about Dirty Half Dozen member number five? This is propaganda and disinformation at its worst. Recently, I was listening to the Joe Rogan podcast. He was interviewing a self-professed conservative. Joe, who is usually very level-headed, right-down-the-middle kind of guy, got really annoyed with the guest when she said she did not believe in climate change. At one point during the discussion, Joe trotted out this 97% claim. So question for skeptics. What does, quote, 97% of climate scientists agree with climate change? What does that mean? It's not even a complete thought agree with climate change. Most skeptics won't be a change. Most skeptics won't be able to answer that basic question, but the real believers will likely say something like what Kerry said, 97% of climate scientists agree that the global warming is real and human activity is the main cause. Okay, now at least that's a little more clear. So what is the truth about this 97% claim? After all, this is the Truth Quest podcast. One of the main papers behind this 97% claim is authored by a guy named John Cook, who runs SkepticalScience.com. He found that over 97% of the papers he surveyed endorsed the view that the Earth is warming up and human emissions of greenhouse gases are the main cause. It turns out that Cook, like the authors of many similar studies, were, shall we say, rather subjective in their classification of papers. Follow-up studies, which actually try to put some definitions around their study, found that only 1-3% to of respondents, quote, explicitly stated agreement with the United Nations Declaration of Global Warming, and that there was no agreement with a catastrophic view. So basically, these studies were purposely misleading and essentially propaganda for the global warming, global cooling, climate change proponents. If you find this hard to believe, again, I encourage you to do your own research. The third piece of evidence I want to bring to your attention is the University of East Anglia scandal. In 2009, hackers published a huge database of UK government, university, and scientific emails that clearly demonstrated the manipulation of global warming research data. The data came from the Climate Research Unit, a group responsible for collecting temperature data that resided in East Anglia. The emails clearly demonstrated collusion and conspiracy to exaggerate warming data. The perpetrators then organized resistance to respond to the disclosure of their data. It was revealed that they suppressed evidence, deleted emails, and manipulated data. Many of the emails showed private admissions of flaws in their public claims, yet they still continued to cherry-pick data that supported their claims. 
They colluded to exclude dissenting scientists from peer review process. They pressured and bullied science journal editors and publishers, and they withheld data from researchers they deemed unhelpful to the global warming cause. The bottom line with this ugly episode specifically, and, and, and the pursuit of the global warming agenda generally, is we have a bunch of tenured academics living off the public dole via research grants and salaries from public institutions, perpetrating a massive fraud in order to keep their money rolling in. Again, I encourage you to look into this on your own. The next piece of evidence is former Vice President and Nobel Prize winner Al Gore's 2006 so-called documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. His stated purpose was to educate citizens about global warming. In the synopsis of the movie, about global warming. In the synopsis of the movie, the film's distributor Paramount warned that if the vast majority of the world's scientists are right, we have just 10 years to avert a major catastrophe that could send our entire planet into a tailspin of epic destruction involving extreme weather, floods, droughts, epidemics, and killer heat waves beyond anything we have ever experienced. Despite the fact that almost every child in middle and high school in the United States has been forced to watch this piece of propaganda trash and the movie receiving unending accolades from fellow global warming alarmists, the film is full of inconsistencies, lies, and innuendo. At one point in 2007, a UK high court ruled that the film, quote, while broadly accurate, contains nine key scientific errors in the context of alarmist and exaggeration. The findings included the claim that the collapse of the major ice sheet in Greenland or in West raised global sea levels by 20 feet, causing massive flooding and producing millions of refugees. The court said that there is no proof offered to substantiate this claim. Secondly, the use of the previously mentioned and discredited hockey stick chart in the movie. The movie claimed the disappearance of snow in Mount Kilimanjaro was directly attributable to global warming, with no proof offered. Another unsubstantiated claim was that the drying up of Lake Chad was due to global warming. The movie blamed Hurricane Katrina on global warming without providing evidence, as if we never had devastating hurricanes before the man-made global warming agenda was contrived. Finally, the movie depicted drowning polar bears caused by long swims to find ice due to melting as proof of global warming. Subsequent to the release of An Inconvenient Truth, the entire drowning polar bear incident had been thoroughly discredited and proven to be false. Essentially what Al Gore did with An Inconvenient, did with an inconvenient Truth was throw everything against the wall in the hopes that some of it would stick. Given the favorable treatment this agenda received in the mainstream media, and despite Gore's unwillingness to sit for interviews with skeptical journalists, he made millions of dollars. The final piece of evidence I want to provide you with is the ridiculous claim that the debate is settled, that there is consensus. Let's start with what we do agree on. We agree that the climate does in fact change, on a daily basis in fact. There are annual seasons and there are long-term trends that change. The debate is settled and there is consensus on that. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, the debate is not settled and there is far from a consensus on the man-made global warming claim. Science is neither subject to opinion nor based on consensus. As a 2012 Wall Street Journal op-ed observed, scientific facts come from observation experiments and careful analysis, not from the near unanimous vote of some people or groups of people. Science progresses via testing a hypothesis against real-world data obtained from observations and rigorous experiments. After all, the Earth is not flat because there is consensus of scientists. It is not flat because it is round. I am reminded of a song called The Scientific Method that all of my kids learned in the sixth grade. You can find it on YouTube. The rap song explains in simple terms how to apply the scientific method that seems to be lost on all scientists who are advocates for the man-made global warming fraud. It goes something like this. Make an observation, ask a question, form a hypothesis, and make a prediction. Do a test or experimentation, analyze data, and draw a conclusion. In the case of the global warming advocates, they start at the end of the process with the conclusion that the earth is warming and man is the cause, and then they back into the data that fit their conclusion. conclusion. As we close this episode, I want to address the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Accord due to all the mainstream media attention they received 
and how they likely influence many people's opinion about climate change. First, the Kyoto Protocol was a treaty adopted in 1997 by 41 countries in the European Union. The purpose of the treaty was to reduce the emissions of gases that contribute to global warming. The treaty was never ratified by the United States Senate because of the detrimental effects it would have had on the U.S. economy. One of the most contentious aspects of the treaty was as it exempted two of the world's largest emitters of pollution, India and China. Yet the United States and the rest of the, of the developed world were expected to cripple their economies by severely cutting their use of fossil fuels in the name of so-called science. One interesting footnote to the Kyoto uh, Treaty is that since its adoption the, adoption, the level of emissions in Europe remains higher than that of the United States. This is one of the rare cases where clearer heads prevailed as the downstream ramifications of the treaty were made known to the American people. The Paris Accord was a non-binding agreement. Note the words non-binding and agreement, as it was neither binding nor was it a treaty ratified by Congress. This was the agreement that President Obama made by himself with almost 200 nations that, according to the New York Times, was a landmark accord that will for the first time commit every country to lowering planet-warming greenhouse gases emissions and help stave off the most drastic effects of climate change. Unfortunately for us, Obama did this without congressional approval, and therefore President Trump undid it in the same manner. Executive orders are not pieces of legislation. I am pur purposely not going into the details of this agreement because the point I'm bringing it up is just to demonstrate how proponents of their dialogue, they are only interested in cramming their agenda down our throats and shutting up those who think differently. As we draw this episode to a close, I want to leave you with one more question for skeptics. How do you explain all the disinformation, lies, and data manipulation? In any other facet of your life, would you believe someone who had a history of lying to you? Have you ever had a friend, coworker, spouse, or family member who tends to stretch the truth, lie, or mislead? Knowing their tendencies, do you take what they say at face value, or do you employ a little healthy skepticism? As I said at the beginning of the episode, my agenda is not to prove or disprove the man-made climate change, global warming, global cooling claim. My agenda is to uncover the truth, and the truth is there has been rampant dishonesty on the part of advocates of this agenda and as such should raise red flags for any honest broker. As outlined in this episode, advocates for this agenda have a hit in employing propaganda to further their claims. In any other arena of life, people who behave in such a manner would have been shunned and laughed off the media stage, but not these folks. Why is that? In a future episode, I will attempt to answer that question as, as well as walk through how the pro-climate change crowd employs the dirty half-dozen in order to stifle debate. Additionally, I will arm you with a series of questions for skeptics that you can use during your next Facebook debate on climate change. Use during your next Facebook debate on climate change.